Thank you for coming to the science talk at Comanfluence. I'm Jeffrey Landis. Some of you know me from one of my activities, which is I am sometimes a science fiction writer, mostly known for short stories. Uh, but I did write a novel a couple of years back, Mars Crossing. And uh, others of you know me from my other activity, which is being a scientist working at NASA Glenn Research Center. And uh, I've given a number of talks at Confluence, mostly about Mars and Venus. But I'd like to go a little bit further out into the solar system today and see if we can talk about something billions and billions of miles away, uh, the moon Triton. So. Exploring Triton, which is Neptune's backwards moon. This is a project I've been working on at NASA Glenn, and I do have to credit the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, which has been funding some ideas beyond the next generation, like this. So let's talk about Triton. Well, here's some of the smaller bodies of the solar system kind of in context. I'm sure you're all familiar with Ganymede and Triton, uh, just a little bit smaller than Mars. So these are the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, respectively, that are actually bigger than some planets. They're bigger than Mercury. Uh, but here's Triton down a little bit lower. Uh, still a pretty big moon as moons go, almost as big as our moon. and our moon is a, a pretty big moon, uh, a little bit bigger than Pluto, in fact. Uh, it is one of the icy moons of the solar system. We know a lot about the icy moons from the uh, two missions, mostly Galileo and Cassini, that have gone to Jupiter and Saturn, but we're talking now about a moon a little bit further out in the solar system. One thing interesting about the icy moons is we're now beginning to think that pretty much all of them have oceans underneath the ice. Uh, some of them thick oceans, Europa has a pretty thin, uh, pretty thick ocean, some of them thinner oceans. Uh, even Titan, which mostly we look at uh, because it's a world with an atmosphere uh, with clouds, with weather, with rain, and with hydrocarbon oceans. But if you go down below the surface, even Titan has an ocean. And uh, Triton is no exception. Uh, Triton seems to be an icy moon. It's very cold. We get below the surface and we see an ocean. So this is what's inside those icy moons. They have a crust that could be ice, could be a mixture of ice and rock. Uh, below that, there's a liquid ocean, probably very saline. Uh, then we may have uh, ice below the ocean as the pressure gets so high. Uh, the high pressure water turns into ice and inside a rocky mantle, and it may or may not have an iron core. So, but Triton, well, here's Triton, the large moon of Neptune the farthest away of the planets. Well, why Triton? What's so interesting about Triton? Triton's only been visited once. The Voyager 2 fly flyby mission uh, went by it in 1989. So in fact, it's one of the least known places in the solar system. Uh, but it's also one of the most interesting. This is in fact the only whole disk color view we have of Triton. I'll show some closer up images of Triton a little bit later, uh, but those are pieced together from photo mosaics. Uh, this is a full frame image from Triton as Voyager came in toward it. Uh, wow, interesting planet, it's pink. I'll get to that later. Here's the Voyager missions. Uh, well, 
In fact, the first idea of Voyager was they said, wow, there's this one opportunity. If we launch in 1978, we can go by all of the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Back then, Pluto was a planet. Uh, turns out they couldn't quite make that date. They did launch in 1979, and it, in fact, was a mission to Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, but they said, well, if we do everything right, we can get a gravity slingshot from Saturn and go on to Uranus and Neptune. So the first of the Voyagers, uh, Voyager 1, uh, in fact, went on to interplanetary and interstellar space. It did not go past uh, the last two. But then they said, well, looks like it worked pretty well. We will just divert Voyager 2, let it take that gravity slingshot from Saturn. It went past Uranus in 1986, did its final flyby, flying past Neptune in August of 1989. So it did a close approach, and this is it. One and only mission to Neptune, and it only spent perhaps an hour at the very close approach to Neptune, where it looked at the planet Neptune itself, discovering that despite being, oh, what, about 30 astronomical units from the sun, uh, nevertheless, it's a planet with these giant storms. Nobody really expected that, uh, big storms on the planet Neptune. Uh, but its large moon, Triton, we discovered, had just amazing and unique geology. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Couple of other odd things that we discovered. Uh, Neptune had a very oddly tilted magnetosphere. Unlike the Earth, the magnetic pole of Neptune is considerably uh, misplaced from the direction of the rotational pole. Uh, we also discovered it didn't have rings, but it had ring arcs, it had partial rings. Uh, very, very odd. Uranus and, Uranus and Neptune are the two blue planets other than the planet Earth. Uh, they're not blue because of water. Uh, they're blue because of methane in the atmosphere. Methane strongly absorbs red, so what gets scattered back is just blue. So Uranus with sort of a turquoise light blue, Neptune a little bit darker with that dark blue color. So why Triton? Visited once, least known places in the solar system, well, why Triton is partly because Pluto is so exciting. Well, what the heck is Pluto? Pluto is this Kuiper Belt object. It's kind of the first, the premier of the objects in the Kuiper Belt, the outer solar system. Here's kind of a color image of Pluto, uh, sort of a rusty red color. That rusty color is not rust. Uh, that rusty color is Tholins. I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, but Pluto has just this amazing geology. Pluto is so cold that rocks are made out of ice. Water is just another form of rock on Triton. And the ice actually is nitrogen. So here's one of the many, many close-ups from New Horizons. And one could talk for hours and hours just about New Horizons visiting uh, Pluto uh, just in and of itself. Uh, but here's a view where we're looking at mountains that are made of water ice on the edge of a glacier. This is a giant glacier basin that's made of nitrogen ice. That's sort of amazing. But Triton is the big brother of Pluto. Triton and Pluto were almost twins separated at birth. So Pluto was fascinating. Let's look at its big brother. Let's look at the big brother, Triton. Triton's a big moon, uh, 1,353 kilometers across, making it bigger than Pluto. Uh, and here's a weird thing, it's in a retrograde orbit. All of the other big moons of the solar sa system go around the same direction the planet rotates. Triton, though, is tilted and it goes around backwards. And it's pink. There's that whole disk image. It is a pink planetoid. So that's no moon. It's a captured Kuiper Belt object. So like Pluto, this is a representative 
of these small objects in the outer solar system. And there are literally millions of these small objects out in the outer solar system that got captured around Neptune and is now in this retrograde orbit. Because if it were, we know it was captured because if it were formed at the same time as Neptune, it would be in the same direction of rotation. So that's the way, that's the way moons work. Actually, that backwards orbit means that Triton is not forever. When a moon orbits around a planet, it raises tides in the planet. The tides in the planet have gravitational force, and that pulls on the moon. So in the Earth, for example, our moon rotates the same direction as the Earth rotates. So those tidal forces on the moon actually increase the orbit of the moon. So the moon is actually leaving. The moon's going farther and farther away every year. Not really a much to notice, a couple of millimeters, but the moon is leaving the Earth. Uh, it's headed away. But Triton orbits backwards. So those tides, instead of making the orbit bigger, that tidal force is trying to make the orbit smaller. So one day it'll get captured all the way by Neptune, gone. So better look at Triton while we can, because in only a few hundred million years, it'll be gone. So uh, don't expect it to be there forever. Well, what about that pink planet? Wow, that pink color is not due to rust. The pink color turns out to be due to these complex organic chemicals called tholins. Remember when I looked at the planet Neptune, I said, oh, it's blue. That's due to hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons turn out to be ubiquitous in the outer solar system, mostly methane. That blue color is methane. But when you take methane and ethane and the hydrocarbons, take a little bit of nitrogen, maybe some other contaminants like sulfur, possibly some phosphorus, you expose them to ultraviolet light from the sun. You expose them to uh, cosmic radiation, what do you get? You get these complicated, mixed up, hydrocarbon-like goo. And Carl Sagan named it tholin. He called this goo tholins because they're this muddy, uh, icky, gooey stuff that frankly we don't know very much about. We've never examined a tholin a tholin from the outer solar system in situ. We've never looked at one close, uh, but we can make similar things in the laboratory, and there's some of them over on the left, and they're sort of gooey, a little bit stinky. And if you look at the uh, spectrum over at the right, we can see, wow, there are these very complicated molecules. Uh, they have amine groups. Uh, they've got polycyclic hydrocarbons. They have chain hydrocarbons very, very complicated. So this brings us to the question, they're everywhere in the solar system once you get beyond about half past the asteroid belt. Well, are these in fact the building blocks of life? We don't really know how life formed. We don't even know what life formed from, but we do know that life is made out of organic molecules, and here they are. Here's the complex organic molecules that were present at the beginning of the solar system. So that's one reason I'm so excited by trying to look at Triton and the outer solar system. Uh, these molecules may be exactly what we need to look at to understand the origin of life. So why Triton? Well, it is the largest and closest to the Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, Pluto is exciting. Triton is bigger. Triton's more dynamic. And this is a whole class of worlds in our solar system. Uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of the big ones, thousands, probably millions of the little ones, which we're only beginning to learn about. Those tholins are the organic compounds. They're characteristic of the Kuiper Belt objects. Oh, I probably use that acronym. Huh. Working for NASA, I'm used to acronyms. KBO, Kuiper Belt objects, uh, that may be the precursor to life. And in orbit around Neptune, it turns out to be the easiest of the Kuiper Belt objects to reach. Not only that, though, 
Blue Belt objects are interesting and have interesting geology. Uh, Triton has this cantaloupe terrain. Uh, not only that, though, it has winds, it has geysers, it has many science targets. It's an interesting place to go to. Uh, well, this is a photo mosaic of Triton. This was clipped together from multiple images when the Voyager 2 made that one close pass of Triton. Uh, and you can see from here all sorts of strange things. They call this in the upper left, we call this cantaloupe terrain. We don't even know what that is. What causes these funny patterns on it? Here's some of the ice plains toward the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, mostly, however, we saw the Southern Hemisphere. Most of the Northern Hemisphere was in darkness when the Voyager went by. But here's the sort of rough and rugged Southern Hemisphere. Uh, wow, what are these things? Look at those. So the physical characteristics, it's a little bit smaller than the moon, about three quarters the size of the moon. Surface area is 23 million square kilometers. If you think that's small, it's about as big as North America. North America has a lot of varied terrain. Mean density is about half the density of Earth. Uh, gravity is about half a lunar gravity. And like the Earth's moon, it rotates exactly as fast as it moves around its primary planet, uh, Neptune, which means one side always faces Neptune, one side's always facing away. Goes around in about six days. So uh, six day sidereal rotation period, just about six day uh, solar day. And that temperature is 38 degrees K. Think of that as about negative 250 centigrade. That's pretty cold. Uh, Triton nitrogen is a form of ice. Strangely enough, and nobody knew this until we first had the Voyagers go by, even so far away, even so cold, Triton has an atmosphere. Uh, here it is sort of marked out. You can see it on this limb view of Triton. Uh, surface pressure is about 1.4 to 1.5 uh, pascal. That's kilograms per square meter. So that's uh, 70,000 times lower atmospheric pressure than the Earth. Still, it's there. It's made out of nitrogen, maybe traces of methane. Uh, methane's mostly going to be a form of frost at this temperature. Uh, but like frost on Earth, there's solid water vapor, liquid water vapor, and gaseous water vapor on Earth. So likewise on Triton, there's a little bit of methane uh, traces in the atmosphere. Uh, just for comparison, here's the atmosphere of Pluto, another uh, planetoid that we thought <laughs> back before we started sending spacecraft out, uh, we had no idea that Pluto would have an atmosphere. Uh, this is Pluto with the sun behind it. So here we are seeing the sun shine directly through the atmosphere of Pluto. So in fact, it's blue for the same reason that the Earth's atmosphere is blue. That's the Rayleigh scattering uh, of Pluto's atmosphere that's mostly nitrogen, as is the atmosphere of Triton. So I pointed out the southern hemisphere, these funny little features. What are those? Those are geysers and dust plumes. So Triton, in fact, is an active planetoid, or at least it was when the Voyager 2 flew by. So these geysers are actually nitrogen geysers. They shoot up nitrogen from the subsurface, and it carries with a, a lot of junk. Uh, so it carries a lot of dust and dirt and subsurface crud. The wind blows the crud a little bit downwind, and then it deposits out on the surface. And we've actually seen about a dozen of these actually erupting as we flew past uh, Triton, and many more of these sort of dead ones where we only see the, the plume that was left behind when the uh, geyser erupted. So Triton is not static. Things are happening on Triton. Uh, right now, even as we speak. Here's a nice image, I like it. It's from uh, Michael Carroll 
uh, showing a, one of these geysers, nitrogen geysers, shooting up uh, nitrogen from the subsurface, uh, but carrying with it a bunch of dirt and crud. And once it reaches the stratosphere, uh, that plume blows downwind. And there in the background, we can see the planet Neptune. That blue color is methane in the mostly hydrogen atmosphere. Uh, and you can see that giant dark spot in atmosphere, or a giant long-lived storm uh, that shows that, well, even here we are, what, uh, 30 astronomical units or so from the sun, uh, we still get amazing weather. So my interest in this was saying, well, we should explore Triton. I've been spending much of my time recently uh, doing a spacecraft uh, design or part of an engineering design group that designs future missions, uh, including this mission for Triton. Huh, and I can see I have a, I will blame auto, autocorrect on that. Triton, T-R-I-T-O-N. Darn you, autocorrect. <laughs> so uh, experience with uh, rovers on Mars says mobility is needed to explore a planet. And remember, uh, Triton is a planet almost as big as Mars. Not quite, almost as big as Mars. So Triton is big and diverse. One landing spot will barely scratch the surface. Uh, no pun intended there. Mm -hmm. Triton's landforms are interesting all the way from the pole to the equator. We want to look at them all. Well, in other studies, we've really proven that using the resources of the place you're going to is the key to long-term exploration. You've probably heard about in situ resource utilization, perhaps on Mars, where they talk about making rocket propellant from the resources of Mars. A friend of mine, Robert Zubrin, has been sort of the main propellant uh, production advocate uh, that you've heard about. He's really absolutely convinced that if we're going to go to Mars, we have to use the atmosphere of Mars to make propellant. So we're saying, well, let's make a radioisotope thermal engine that can open up operations on bodies across the solar system by using the resources of the body that we're exploring. So what the heck is on the surface of Triton? Well, here's what's on the surface. Actually, at the equator, we see snow fields. Those snow fields are nitrogen snow. Once you get away from the equator, we have seasonal nitrogen caps, uh, and that's ice rich. Actually, basically nitrogen ice it gets to be about a meter thick. And then underneath that, we have the permanent nitrogen uh, ice cap. So what is available on Triton? The answer is what we have is a lot of nitrogen. So we need to use nitrogen for propellant if we're going to use the in situ resources that we have. So the Triton Hopper project, the goal was to land on Triton, which would be the first ever mission to land or even orbit a Kuiper Belt object. We want mobility on Triton. Many targets of interest. We need long distance mobility. And of course, we need to communicate to send our findings back home. Well, let's play the little movie here. Uh, this was the movie we made of the Triton Hopper uh, project. So here we are. There's the Triton Hopper with a geyser in the background. So we land. We have our robotic arm. And in this particular, this is the phase one design. We go down and we just scoop up nitrogen right off the surface. All we have to do is reach out and nitrogen ice, plenty of it. Once we've excavated a little hole, lift off, we heat it up with our radioisotope rocket engine. The heated nitrogen, we use that as a rocket engine. It gives us a hop. This was our phase one design. Phase one design gave us about five kilometers of distance per hop. Next spot. 
land and do it again. Dig more nitrogen, of course, at the same time, we can uh, analyze it. We can get some information about uh, what it is that we're, we're making. So this is what we were planning to do. We store energy in a thermal mass that's heated by the radioisotopes. Radioisotopes are little, actually pretty tiny little chunks of plutonium, uh, not the type of plutonium you make bombs from, different isotope that just produces heat. Then we pass the nitrogen through the heated block, gives us hot gas. What's hot gas good for? Hot gas is good for rocket engines. So here's more of a schematic. Uh, the blue would be the heated mass. We have a couple of hundred tubes that go through the mass, send it to the rocket engine nozzles. Lot of different choices for what we could make the thermal mass out of. Turns out the best choice as we looked at it was to make it out of lithium. Our reason is lithium when it melts, uh, gives up a lot of heat. So this graph, if you read it from left to right, is how much energy it takes to heat up various compounds, lithium, lithium fluoride, beryllium. But of course, uh, we're using it the other direction. We start with it hot and it's cooling down and giving off heat. But the lithium looked like about the best of the many choices for what to store heat in. So here's uh, actually how we do it. It's the phase two design. Phase two design, we actually just core straight down into the nitrogen ice. Just drill straight down, get a core. Two reasons for that. One is that the geologists like to look at cores because as ice deposits, it gives you stratigraphy and you get the time history of the deposition uh, of the ice. But once we've dug up the core, once we've analyzed it, we drop it into the liquefaction chamber, close it up, heat it up, liquefy it, and then drain it into the tank. So it goes out, cool. drains into the tank, and we have the tank full of liquid nitrogen. So uh, here's our uh, <laughs> the artist's conception of us lifting off maybe a little bit dramatic in that artist's conception. Uh, so that was our phase one. Here's our phase two design. Uh, we worked a little bit uh, harder trying to get a more distance. In the phase two design, we can go about 32 kilometers in a hop. Uh, however, for engineering purposes, we want to keep uh, a little bit of margin. We want to assume that never uh, everything won't necessarily work perfectly. Uh, so with margin, we run with a hop of about 21 kilometers per hop, saving a little bit of capability. Maybe uh, after we demonstrate it, we might see if we can go all the way. So 21 kilometers every time we hop. So that's only 100 watts of plutonium is only all we need uh, to do that. We use that to heat 100 kilograms of nitrogen propellant. So just comparison, here's a size comparison. We run off 100 watts. Here's a 100 watt vehicle on the Earth. About the same size, mass, and power as a solar powered golf cart. How do we get there? Well, we had to design a vehicle to get there. Triton is billions and billions of miles away. So, in the phase one, we said, well, let's get there with solar electric propulsion. So, well, solar propulsion works pretty well in the inner solar system, so we can get our thrust to go out there. It doesn't work quite so well when we're less than 1% of Earth's sunlight at Neptune, so we end up having to use aero capture. So we brushed in against the atmosphere of Neptune to capture. Phase two, we said, well, let's do something a little bit better. So we designed a vehicle, Abeona, a nuclear electric propulsion vehicle to take us to Triton. Abiona, by the way, is the Roman goddess of journeys. Oh. So Abiona, 
takes us on the journey out to Neptune, pretty big, uh, 15 meters long uh, in this. And this is the stowed configuration, but then we pop it out once uh, it's in the cruise configuration, 17 and a half kilowatts of nuclear power. That's tiny by nuclear reactor uh, standpoint. Uh, on Earth, a nuclear reactor might be a gigawatt or two. So 17.5 kilowatts is tiny. Uh, I've actually seen this reactor. It's uh, about the size of a wastebasket. Uh, we deploy it for crews on the end of this truss. What that does is it actually just puts the nuclear reactor as far away as possible from all those sensitive electronics. Uh, the reason is, turns out, on Earth, we just take a nuclear reactor and say, hey, no problem, this is Earth. Uh, we'll put a couple of tons of concrete around it. Well, not a whole lot of tons of concrete sitting around available in space. Uh, so we say, well, let's just move it away. Uh, let's put it 25 uh, meters away from everything else uh, so that we don't get the radiation. So it says two seven kilowatt ion thrusters. Uh, we also have a spare, just in case one of them stops working. That gets us to uh, Triton, and the actual Triton hopper is down here, uh, hidden away and back. I should mention that this is the vehicle, but once we've delivered the hopper, uh, the vehicle is still in orbit. We can use it both as the orbital relay to give us communications, uh, but it's also a perfectly capable science vehicle in and of itself, so we can do science of Neptune. Uh, and Triton. In fact, if you look at it, you see these giant antennas. Uh, well, what are those antennas? Well, it turns out uh, we said, well, since we're in orbit around Triton anyway, uh, let's put a low frequency ground penetrating radar so we can actually be able to look through the ice, look for those reservoirs of liquid nitrogen that are causing the geysers, and possibly even look for the liquid ocean a liquid water ocean that's hidden underneath the ice. So that's what we do with the ground penetrating radar. Not all of the science is on the hopper. Well, even with nuclear electric propulsion, it turns out it's pretty tricky to get from Earth to uh, Triton. So first we come in, we make a flyby past Venus. Uh, that kicks us out, oh, a little bit past Mars. That gives us a phasing to do another flyby past Venus. But here's the big one. We go past Earth, and that kicks us into the outer solar system. And we start thrusting with our engines. Takes a long time. Uh, it takes a decade to get out to Neptune. Neptune is a very long way to go. But that brings us to Neptune. We fire the engines again to stop at Neptune and then spiral down uh, on Triton. We've done a number of different trajectories here. Uh, some of them, we actually use Jupiter flybys. Uh, Jupiter is a better flyby to get you to the outer planets. Reason is Jupiter is so big, it has a much stronger gravity that can give you a stronger kick to the outer solar system. Uh, the reason we didn't use it in that trajectory is we didn't want to wait. <laughs> it takes a long time. It takes about almost a Jupiter year for Jupiter to line up again with Neptune. We just didn't want to wait. We wanted to launch this in the early 2030s, uh, not wait for the end of, uh, end of the, for the launch window that goes to Jupiter uh, to open up again. So there's that particular picture. Uh, we've done a number of different, uh, different pictures. This particular one was a 15 year interplanetary time of flight. Uh, we can do a little bit faster if we go by Jupiter, uh, but we have to wait. <clears throat> so there's actually a comparison. There is our 17 kilowatt vehicle, uh, but just for comparison, here is a 16 kilowatt vehicle uh, that Elon Musk launched into space, just to compare. Hmm. That one actually is not actually operating at 16 kilowatts uh, in space. 
So conclusions. Uh, the first conclusion is Triton is interesting. It's a long way away, but it is a nearest Kuiper Belt object. It's the big brother of Pluto. It is interesting and different in every possible way. And an example of those icy moons of the outer solar system. So the hopper uses a new type of engine, a radioisotope thermal engine that self-refuels, can use the nitrogen collected from the environment uh, of Triton. Uh, we did a phase one design, showed that we could make it work. Phase two design, a better vehicle, farther, faster, gets there sooner. And we did experimental demonstration of key issues, including testing of actually digging solid nitrogen. So with that, I think I may uh, close this off and uh, see if I can get some questions from the audience. So let's see, I guess you can put them in the Q&A window or you can put them in the chat window. Uh, looks like people are using the Q&A window. Okay. Question one, Francis Graham, first person to suggest uh, nuclear reactors and electric propulsion was Kraft Ericke. Uh Yes, his designs were in the late 1950s. Yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, Quite a few of the German scientists were very interested in electric propulsion. Uh, in fact, actually the first demonstration of a working electric propulsion unit was done at NASA Glenn. It was done by Kaufman. Uh, but then the Mars mission designs of the 1950s, 1960s, they said, wow, uh, let's use those nuclear electric propulsion uh, units. I should dig up an image, uh, the nuclear pro electric propulsion images from the 1950s were really sort of amazing. Uh, if you saw the Walt Disney uh, image of, uh, what did they call it? Man in space, I think, of, of Mars missions. Uh, they had that nuclear electric propulsion. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, propulsion system there. Uh, let's see if I have a picture of that. Make sure I have a picture of that somewhere. Well, maybe I don't. Uh, the interesting thing about the uh, nuclear electric propulsion vehicles going to Mars was the radiators. Uh, they had big umbrella shaped uh, radiators to get rid of the waste heat. And uh, they sort of looked like um, little umbrellas that were flying uh, on the way to Mars. Uh, very interesting. So yeah, Kraft Ericke uh, and company uh, designing, oh, there's an image. Okay, Ernst Stuhlinger, another of the great uh, scientists of the, of, oh, here's a vision from, uh, yeah, there's one. Let me see if I can share that. Oh, uh, come on, let's share screen. Just, uh, there's that view of the nuclear electric propulsion by uh, Ernst Stuhlinger for the, uh, the Disney, I believe, uh, special on how to get to Mars. Okay. Okay, what other questions do we have? Uh, will the hopper be remotely controlled or by an AI on board? Uh, the answer is sort of both. Uh, because the timing of the day-night cycle on Triton is six days, uh, we can wait the hours it takes. So it takes hours to send information back from Triton because it is so far away. So what we do is once we've landed, we characterize the landing area. We have these images from above, I'd say airborne, uh, there's air on Titan. So if the airborne images, so while the lander is doing automated scientists, so automated science, the scientists on the ground are analyzing the data and planning the next hop. So when we're ready, uh, basically six days later, uh, they send the pre-programmed hop to the hopper but then the hopper itself does everything autonomously. It has its own 
obstacle avoidance. Uh, we can't actually fly it like you might fly a remote controlled drone. It has to be entirely autonomous because the round trip light time is just too long to fly it. So we program it from Earth, but then it flies itself. Okay, another question. With the rise of commercial spacecraft, what might tempt corporations to explore, exploit Triton? Well, Triton's an awfully long way to go right at the moment. Uh, man, when you're talking billions of miles away, it's hard to find something to ship home. Uh, I think the space industrialists might be very interested in the radioactive rocket engine, uh, because we use that rocket engine other places. We could use it on Mars, we could use it on Ceres, uh, we could use it on Pluto or sort of anywhere. Uh, so the rocket engine might be very useful. The idea that you can use in situ resources uh, might be useful. Probably we're not going to exploit Triton. I'm afraid that would be a little bit later. Another question from Jane Kay. Will the Triton mission send information on other planets and objects that passes on the way to Neptune? Uh, yeah, actually, for a lot of missions uh, recently, ever since I think Galileo, uh, the astrodynamics team has been looking at the mission and saying, well, do we pass anything else on the way? Or could we divert something to pass on the way? So uh, sure, uh, if we can pick a trajectory that goes past uh, asteroids, some of the main belt asteroids, possibly even some of the trans-Neptunian objects, uh, sure, absolutely, let's go take a look at them. Learn what we can. How does the hopper balance when it lands? Uh, well, it'll have to be autonomously, uh, but we're going to put in a lot of self-guidance, uh, basically sensors. So it will have inertial guidance systems. It'll be able to measure its own attitude. Uh, and uh, most importantly, of course, we have this orbiter overhead. So by the time we land, we will have taken photographs of the landing site uh, that give us uh, the location of any rocks, of any slopes, any mountains, uh, down to about 10 centimeters. So before we try to land, uh, we'll make sure that we can find a nice flat spot. So we're not going to be landing on a big rocks that are going to tilt us over. Uh, we're going to find a good spot. And it'll all be done by uh, self-guidance, not that different from uh, Elon Musk's uh, self-driving Tesla, except of course we fly through the Triton atmosphere and are a little bit further away. What will happen to the hopper after it ends its job? Does it stay there and continue collecting? Does it come back? Uh, well, it doesn't come back. It's a long way from Triton uh, back to the Earth and we just don't have anything like the amount of propellant needed to, uh, to take us all the way back back home. So it's going to stay there. <clears throat> Most missions, uh, if the engineers do a good job, the hardware will still be working uh, long after the nominal end of mission. So we will keep hopping uh, as long as we can. Sooner or later something will break, uh, but it's not designed to have anything to break. But when something does break, uh, eventually the lander will become a landed station. It won't be a hopper anymore. And then we'll just, I guess, sort of sit there, maybe learn something about, keep analyzing samples, uh, and maybe learn something a little bit about the weather uh, on Triton. Uh, meanwhile, however, the orbiter uh, will raise its orbit and then go in orbit around Neptune maybe learn something about Neptune, uh, possibly look at the other smaller moons of Neptune, because uh, Triton is not the only moon of Neptune, it's just the biggest moon of Neptune. So the orbiter itself will move on out, uh, look at Neptune, 
look at the rings of Neptune, look at the other, other moons of Neptune. We have four minutes, uh, no other questions? Uh, let's see, that's the webinar chat. Okay, any complications from Bill Higgins if the ice is dirty rather than pure nitrogen? Uh, yes, that could be a complication. Uh, that's something we worried a lot about. What could make it dirty? All sorts of things. Some of that dust that was brought up by the geysers. Tholins, we know there's tholins on the surface. Silicate in the form of dust. Uh, even contaminants of things like uh, water, other forms of ice. Uh, that's complicated. That actually is the reason that we picked the particular way that we did uh, for filling the tanks. We ended up filling the tanks using uh, first digging up the ice and then putting it in the, the hopper. And then the hopper was used to uh, melt it. And then we let the liquid run so essentially the, uh, the liquid nitrogen feed system is essentially distilling uh, the nitrogen that we, we dig out of the soil. So the heavy stuff, uh, anything that's still solid at 77 degrees Kelvin, uh, just falls to the bottom and we dump it out. In fact, let me see if I can share that, uh, that screen. So I don't want that one, where's my Zoom? Uh, Here's the, well, let's see. Here's the image that I showed. Uh, so that's the, here we go. Uh, yeah, let's get this out of the way. So we dig the nitrogen up in the core. The core goes here into the liquefaction chamber, sort of showed over here. Uh, it has a top lid that closes it as a bottom lid that closes. So we heat it up, we allow it to liquefy, we drain the nitrogen into the tank, and then we open up the bottom and dump out the junk at the bottom uh, when we're done. So that's how we take care of the, uh, the dirt. What other places in the solar system should we explore, in your opinion? Everywhere. Uh, I've actually become very interested in Venus in the last few years. Uh, Venus is sort of fascinating. It's Earth's evil twin. Of course, those of you who go to Confluence are, I think, quite aware that I'm fascinated by Venus. Uh, but everywhere. You, every time you look at a different place in the solar system, you start saying, wow, that is exciting. Uh, that is interesting. Uh, with the radioisotope thermal engine, uh, we can hop around on pretty much any of the moons of the outer solar system. So that would open up the outer solar system to uh, exploration, to robotic exploration. Uh, there's really no place we can't go from uh, Mercury all the way out to the Kuiper Belt. And you know what? It's all interesting. I think this is right about the end of the time. So thank you for coming.